Hello, eCognition and Yellowscan fans. Um, we are just sneaking in our monthly webinar here for April, last day of the month. Um, we have an interesting talk today. Myself, Keith Peterson, I am the product manager for our Trimble eCognition software, and my guest, Cliff Holly from Yellowscan, will be presenting. Uh, the uh, very interesting topic here, looking at the future of vegetation analysis uh, mapping in feeder corridors uh, with Trimble eCognition, uh, boosted by wonderful yellow scan uh, LIDAR data. And uh, we have some, some good stuff to cover here. I'm gonna give a in brief introduction to eCognition to begin with. And then we'll look at the status, the current status of vegetation encroachment analysis out there on the market. And then we'll, we'll get an introduction to uh, yellow scan for anybody who's out there that's unfamiliar with yellow scan. Um, this, is a, this is a good chance. Cliff can uh, cover all the ins and outs of yellow scan and UAV based LIDAR, a really cool technology that's, that's been uh, becoming more popular over the last uh, uh, several years. Then uh, we're going to take a look at uh, several um, projects. Uh, first, we're going to start out with the the real topic here is risky tree detection, looking at how we can automate the detection of these various trees using purely point cloud information and what type of deliverables we get from that. And then, um, like I said in the, the webinar description, uh, we took the opportunity here to really try and push the envelope with eCognition. What can we do with uh, our, our, our great uh, point cloud feature extraction tools? And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, some some call it a pilot project that, that we've been working on internally. Uh, I don't want to say any more now because I don't want to spoil it. Um, so we'll take a look at some of this 3D line uh, extraction work we've been doing. And uh, then, then we'll finish off with some uh, questions and answer. Um, just before we dump, jump into the uh, webinar though, um, let's cover some of the, the rules. Yes, everybody's on listen only mode. So it's uh, correct that your mics are turned off. I hope you can hear me fine um, and that all the audio and presentation is going, going well. If you have questions during the webinar, please uh, submit these in the question field. Uh, we will be taking some breaks throughout the webinar to ask uh, questions here or there. So feel free to fire those off uh, right away when, when something comes up. And also, if for whatever reason you have to exit the webinar early, you get distracted, you miss something, don't worry. The webinar is going to be recorded. It will be available uh, in the Trimbo Geospatial Webinar Archive, as well as our eCognition TV YouTube channel um, afterwards. And you can go and rewatch uh, the material that we've covered here over and over again. So that being said, we'll jump right into our topic today. I'm going to start with an introduction to the the Trimble eCognition. So we have maybe some folks out there that are, are yellow scan uh, users or uh, UAV uh, LiDAR users in general that uh, maybe not be familiar with the concept of eCognition. So let's take a look at the idea of Trimble eCognition. First of all, what we are all about is transforming our geospatial data into geospatial information. So we're taking these uh, representations of the real world uh, that come in, say, image data, for example, on a raster or elevation data, whether it's going to be a point cloud or rasterized with a point cloud's coming from LIDAR, whether it's coming from, say, a photogrammetric source, we can uh, incorporate this, these um, wonderful data sets um, and create information from them. Traditionally, though, this has been a manual process. So we go in to our, our, let's say our area of photos, we're looking for forested area, we go in, we digitize these areas in, in the photo, um, but it's required a manual operator, an expert to go in and actually do the information extraction, the change detection, or even object recognition. Where eCognition comes in is then to sort of take over the, the manual step and now automate these, these steps that uh, we were once taking to create then land cover maps, impervious surface maps, maybe even looking at individual trees, so extracting those, uh, those individual objects. And that is the, the, real, the real art form uh, of, of becoming an eCognition rule set developer is to, to automate this. And we're gonna show some of this in, uh, in our, our 
demonstration today. Again, a Trimble eCognition for mapping. Where does uh, the eCognition software fall into this, uh, this, this workflow? So we're transform, transforming our, our raw data satellite, aerial, or drone sensor, uh, and we're really turning this into the rich uh, geospatial information, but where does all this happen during a, sorry, your, the lifespan of your project or your, your data? And we obviously have the collection from various sensor types. Uh, we have what we call pre-processing or, or processing step. This is where we take those the, the raw material, we're creating orthophotos, image mosaics, point clouds, elevation models, so whether that happens in uh, software like the, the Trimble Info Package or Trimble Business Center, there are a number of, of options for getting this, this data processed and ready then for eCognition, where we come in is then the analysis and uh, the, the information extraction. And then finally, what happens to this, this information that we're generating is that we uh, create then the, the input for, say, uh, various GIS um, softwares that are out there. So we're taking the data and we're creating the information that is then used in, in, in or elsewhere. That being said, uh, we're going to get to the topic of vegetation analysis in, in feeder corridors. It's uh, the one, the, the, the story that we're looking at today, if you will. And how this, uh, the, the problem itself is, you know, I think last year in, in the, the Munich, Germany area, we had a very severe uh, winter. We saw a lot of this, uh, these problems happening all over, over southern Germany and into Austria with severe snow and storms going on. We have trees, uh, various other encroaching vegetation coming into uh, corridors. And when that's uh, combined with wind, storms, snow, any type of uh, these types of events, we get uh, interruptions in, say, the electric uh, uh, network. Um, but we can also on just um, the um, an electric uh, corridor. We also have situations in gas pipelines, rail corridors, road corridors, any of these types of of corridor setups will need to monitor what type of encroachment is coming into that, whether it's going to be vegetation or some type of other object. How is this uh, currently being done? Uh, well, we have terrestrial inspection. We're sending out people with hardware devices to take notes, GPS locations um, with boots on the ground. We also have aerial inspections. Maybe it's a helicopter or, or another type of flight uh, where a professional is up there and uh, doing the actual monitoring. And then you have also pre-existing point cloud classifications, these based on manual interpretation. Um, and the problem is all three of these, it's manual work, uh, so it's cost intensive and time consuming. Also, we're relying on the various expert opinions uh, to do this work. So there's less standardization as, uh, as there maybe should be. Where are we taking this in the future? So just looking at the future vegetation analysis in, in these feeder corridors, uh, we have a lot of new or emerging technologies that are allowing us to collect more data at, at more affordable uh, prices. And one of these is, is obviously uh, UAVs. So this enables us to collect uh, data in, in, a, in a wonderful, um, high quality. Um, and this allows us to better automate the, in, the entire um, analysis process. So what do we need? Well, we're taking input information. So you know, we start out with uh, a, the power line corridor itself. This could be a shape vector file, so a vector file. We can combine that then with the data collection. Could be a combination of images and uh, point clouds, whether it's going to be LIDAR or photogrammetric point clouds. Again, eCognition can, can handle uh, these files as long as they're in LAS or LAZ formats. Um, the images, as we'll see in the, in the projects that I'm going to demonstrate today, uh, I'm not actually working with imagery. So the images become optional um, in the workflow that, uh, that I've chosen. We're basing this solely on, on the point cloud data itself. 
And of course, we want this output, our analysis output, uh, this is going to be when we want to identify risky trees or parts of the canopy um, that need to be uh, removed, addressed in, in some manner uh, by, the, by the operator. So that is a quick introduction to e-cognition and uh, the problem at hand that we're going to look at today. Um, like I said, uh, we go, we've have just uh, partnered with a yellow scan for, for this uh, for this webinar. It, it gave us a great chance to test out some of the some of the stuff we've been working on with a UAV based lidar systems. And I'd just like to introduce my my guest speaker uh, quickly here. I think he'll he can do himself more justice. Um, it's Cliff Hall. You've known Cliff for for well, ever since I've been with Trimble. It's it's been a, it's been a great uh, work that we've had to, together. Um, He's had uh, over 25 years of, of geospatial information experience um, with all sorts of uh, cool projects within the industry from uh, GIS database development remote to uh, looking at remote sensing techniques and uh, LIDAR and photogrammetric services. And now he's uh, working at, at Yellowscan as their, um, as their GM and uh, business developer. And uh, Cliff, uh, Noah has some slides to just introduce for those of you maybe coming from the cognition background, not familiar with uh, yellow scan uh, technology. Uh, Cliff, I'm going to hand over the reins of the presentation to you and you can um, tell us about uh, yellow scan. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Let me. All right. Can you see that okay there? I can see your screen fine, Cliff. So, uh, perfect. Away. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to everyone there. I know you're coming in from a lot of different locations, so uh, I'll bypass the uh, good mornings and good afternoons and just say hello. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity. As uh, Keith mentioned, uh, we've known each other for a while. I've known the eCognition product for a while. And have been, uh, you know, very directly and indirectly uh, involved and enamored with the product. Um, and as you would imagine, of course, with any uh, the data production process, uh, you know, it, it all starts with the input. You know, on, on the first day there was data, so to speak. And that, you know, that's kind of the part of the the process that YellowScan comes into this with. Um, you know, the better it refines the data, the better understood and characterized the data. Uh, the better the workflow uh, can be automated, and ultimately uh, the results can be uh, shown to be, you know, to be relevant and, and useful. Uh, what I want to do is just show uh, just a quick summary here, a little bit about yellow scan, nothing uh, too heavy. Uh, for those that are new to LIDAR, just a couple of slides about what we're talking about, uh, and then a brief overview of just a few of our uh, UAS LIDAR products. Uh, how those products uh, provide the unique mapping capabilities, uh, and then just the general workflow of how you would bring that data uh, through the hardware, <clears throat> through our software system, and then to the point where um, you know eCognition, and, and in this case Keith would take over and and utilize those data. So about Yellow Scan, uh, we've been manufacturing lidar for UAV since about 2012. Um, but we come from a longer heritage. Uh, our sister company, Lavion Jeune, uh, which is um, a, a French company in the south of France, uh, has been doing uh, geospatial service projects for, uh, you know, for, for many years and um, have a variety of academics and uh, commercially oriented folks doing all types of uh, aerial acquisitions and, and, and providing data results uh, out of that data. But um, you know they they quickly came to recognize in their manned acquisitions uh, that they had a real need for a small, lightweight, not so power hungry lidar system that could be flown in the environments where a manned aircraft either just couldn't be uh, justified for cost or uh, needed to be reflown on such a regular occasion that uh, having the regionalized asset was a bigger requirement. And so uh, we, you know, hence developed the first concept of a yellow scan LIDAR. The company became uh, known in, in France as Yellow Scan. 
and uh, then throughout the uh, the last few years, and then most recently this year, uh, excuse me, 2018, uh, we we opened the uh, the second office. This one now being here in the United States, uh, in Salt Lake City. So we have a Yellow Scan Inc. operating here in Utah, uh, focused on the uh, sales and support of our customers in the Americas, both North, South, and, and Central. Um, let me back that up for just one second, actually. Um, what I didn't mention here is that all of our systems um, have included in them a Trimble or a Planix APX series board uh, that ties us even closer to the Trimble family. Uh, it's not just the hardware that's in our systems that makes us uh, you know, part of the family, but also the fact that by using these APX uh, series boards, we are also able to use uh, the, the Trimble uh, satellite-based correction service or the PP, the post-processing RTX feed, uh, which would allow you also then to choose whether you correct your data with uh, localized base station, um, cores, if you happen to be uh, in the vicinity of, of a core station network, um, or in this case, uh, being able to do a post-processing uh, through this RTX feed. So it, it really is a liberating uh, technology to not have to drag uh, another piece of gear in the field. As I mentioned earlier, two offices, headquarters in the south of France in Montpellier, and our newest office in Salt Lake City. And actually, I guess I have to back that up. We actually have a, a, an even newer newest office uh, in, in Japan. We've just uh, announced the joint venture um, in, in Japan. And so we will have a uh, Yellow Scan Japan office uh, opening uh, in the, the very near term. So as I mentioned, we've got uh, many years of experience in the field flying both uh, fixed wing, rotary, multi-rotor, um, manned and unmanned, uh, constantly looking for high quality products and services to deliver to this, uh, this group uh, that was involved in services for all this time. And in the background of all of this, uh, software development, a combined 100 years of, of software development experience. Uh, that we're now bringing into the uh, the side of of, of yellow scan for not only the initial pre-processing but also doing uh, an appropriate amount of of post-processing support uh, to make uh, you know make the tool as useful in the field uh, as is reasonable. So just very quickly, what is LIDAR for those that aren't uh, directly involved in it uh, already? Uh, light. Light detection and ranging is the acronym. So LIDAR is really just, if you're familiar with radar or the concepts of sonar, it's simply sending out, in this case, a laser-based signal rather than some sort of sound or acoustics uh, and, and using the, the speed of light and time, uh, timing circuitry to basically determine the, the distance or range that each of those laser shots takes before it hits a surface, reflective surface, and comes back to the receiver. Uh, that's the primary concept. So you have an emission and then some number of echoes and then ultimately the reception of those echoes back up to the receiver. The multi-echo technology is one of the, uh, the core, I guess, capabilities that really differentiates um, LiDAR technology from some of the, uh, I guess, more um, passive sensing like camera-based systems in that uh, you can receive more than one echo or more than one return for a given LiDAR pulse. And what that allows for then, of course, is uh, for one single laser pulse to be able to look at multiple surfaces, whether that's the, the top and the bottom uh, of a fence or wall, uh, penetrating through various parts of the structure of canopy, and ultimately, uh, in most cases, you know, trying to get down to the ground uh, to discern modeling capabilities underneath the surface of the canopy of the trees. Uh, the laser beam, how that works, obviously it's not just a straight line. Obviously the light diverges as it, uh, as it uh, exits the system down to the ground and that divergence and that spread of the beam um, somewhat allows for multiple surfaces. So only a portion of the beam is interfered with, uh, if you will, on the first and 
topic or the first return here at this level of the rest of the beam going down to the next and then of course the next and the next. So depending on the complexity of the LIDAR system that you're using, um, many different uh, echoes can then ultimately be discreetly discerned and measured. So what's in a yellow scan LIDAR? And I would go so far as to say that the basic components uh, shown here are really in most any LIDAR system, uh, how we configure ours, the choices of, of, of uh, subsystems and the way that we integrate all those subsystems uh, makes us unique in our sense. But uh, basically you have the three components, a laser scanner, uh, this is the device that's gonna be doing the distance measurement. Um, it's gonna emit the laser pulses and record the travel time for the echoes uh, that that particular system is capable of keeping track of. It's also gonna measure the scan angle for those particular uh, laser shots that are being sent so that you know where uh, those, those points are hitting the ground. Of course, then you have the navigation and positioning systems. This, uh, again, is the, the Trimble product, the APX15 and the APX20 uh, are the two products that we're currently using in our, our LiDAR systems. Uh, using those to determine the absolute position, this is the GNSS side of the, of the boards, as well as the orientation, which is the IMU or the initial uh, mapping unit um, uh, of the, uh, the sensor, so the pitch, roll, and yaw of the aircraft, so then you know exactly where that LIDAR is pointing as it shoots its laser. And then finally, the onboard computing technology. This is the computational portion that's required to define the precise echo positions and, uh, and, and is required for uh, the on-flight data visualization uh, when you're using that functionality as well. Um, our systems also incorporate, because we are um, uh, sort of a, a fully standalone system, we have our own power source built uh, and it's, it's a removal, removable interchangeable battery. Uh, we also have the onboard data storage. So in reality, these systems are really just in need of a platform to carry it with an appropriate vibration isolation uh, to ensure that the LIDAR is operating at uh, optimum uh, capabilities. So in this full system, then again, of course, you have this GNSS uh, correction system, whether that's your local base station, core station, uh, or as I mentioned, the RTX feed uh, coming from Trimble to those uh, Aplanix boards. Uh, the entire system then becomes known to where it is, where it's pointing, the timing and everything. And at that point, then you can create um, your point cloud with known uh, coordinates of a known accuracy and quality. These are the fully integrated sensor systems that we offer. Um, our initial product in the beginning was our yellow scan mapper, which has now moved into mapper two model. Um, the, uh, the surveyor is our, uh, our we have two, two models using the Velodyne uh, products. The VLP 16 is our surveyor, so it's a 16 laser system. I'll tell you a little bit more about the specs on these in a moment. Um, we have the Ultra, which is the Velodyne VLP32 or the, the Puck Ultra. And then we have a series that we call our VX series, uh, the 15 and 20, which are both using the Regal Minivux laser head and then either the Aplanix 15 or the Aplanix 20, APX20 um, on those systems. Then, uh, and lastly, of course, we have the uh, the newest of that series, which is our VX20DL, which is the downward looking. So um, in this particular instance, it's still the Regal Minivux, but it's the downward looking or DL version. A special filtering, a circular filtering, takes the entirety of the 100,000 pulses per second uh, that would normally be spinning 360 degrees around the uh, uh, the device and, and concentrates them in a circular pattern directly downward into a 46 degree field of view. Uh, very, very much uh, targeted towards the corridor type um, mapping exercises. Uh, just to kind of give you a very brief uh, uh, comparison of the different systems, uh, four laser beams versus the 1632 and the one. 
uh, the number of echoes, you know, you have three standard Belladines right now, R2 echoes, uh, the, the, the Regal-based systems in the VX series, uh, a maximum of five echoes. And so you can see also then the density of the data being collected from, you know, 18,500 uh, to as much as 600,000 echoes per, uh, or excuse me, shots, laser shots per, per second, um, and then 100,000 for the single laser of the uh, VX. I'll just kind of go through this a little bit quickly so we can jump into the uh, the use of the data. But, um, you know, what makes LIDARs and, and UAV situations make sense uh, is, is the scale oftentimes. Now that's obviously changing as uh, the LIDAR systems become smaller and more powerful, um, as the UAV platforms become um, more, more, more powerful and capable to fly longer durations as uh, government agencies become, you know, more adept at uh, figuring out how to let these systems fly in, in mixed airspace. Um, we're starting to see that, you know, what makes sense economically for these platforms is, is, is shifting. But suffice to say that, you know, a, a mapping uh, system with a you know, VTOL, some type of a fixed wing, vertical takeoff and landing, uh, you know, easily 30 kilometers in a session, 400 hectares in a session uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be, you know, anywhere near um, uh, unreasonable. Smaller areas, if you've got um, a multi-rotor, any of the multi-rotors out there, again, 10 to 100 hectares is a pretty good sweet spot. Although we've certainly had people flying much larger areas with, uh, with those multi-rotors as well. Of course, any kind of mapping under vegetation, uh, hard to access areas. Uh, these are not just, uh, you know, human on the ground, hard to access, but oftentimes it's hard to access financially by getting, you know, the mobilization costs um, for manned aircraft to come in and do certain things. The fact that we can fly much lower than even, uh, you know, manned helicopters typically, um, just due to the size and scale also gives us a data density and an accuracy that uh, at times can even be better uh, than some of those platforms as well. And of course, uh, you know, accuracy is a scale, it depends on what you need. Every tool has its job, every job has a requirement. Uh, so we have a variety of tools that can provide accuracy somewhere in the two and a half to uh, 10 centimeter range. And, you know, I, I, I choose not to do a, a comparison of, of, say, photogrammetry versus LIDAR. Uh, I think in our opinion, uh, the two uh, technologies are very complementary to one another, uh, but there are some strengths and weaknesses uh, that each can bring to the table. Now, in our situation, we fly both sensor types concurrently. Uh, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, the data that came um, to Keith for this uh, exercise today was from our VX20 uh, also carrying dual uh, Sony RGB cameras, and so uh, obviously taking the benefits of both and, and maximizing the utilization of a single flight is what uh, many of our, our end users are, are currently interested in. But as far as LiDAR is concerned, you know, being able to penetrate the vegetation, um, I say any weather, obviously there's limitations, but, you know, photogrammetry is going to have a real hard time in fog. Uh, we can get through some of that uh, much more easily. Uh, the high contrasts, anyone that's done photogrammetry and trying to do image balancing uh, it knows that you know, the high contrast areas are often a problem. Obviously, that's not an issue with LIDAR because of the active laser nature of the, the data acquisition. Uh, low sun angles, um, dark, dusk, as long as you're allowed to fly in your region in those time frames, uh, we don't need the light uh, of, of the sun to obviously get out and collect data. And, but, you know, believe it or not, obviously a lot of our LIDAR systems are based on lasers that would actually be absorbed by, by water. Um, but when snow uh, is, is, is of a dry content, dry water content or moisture content, we can actually do quite a lot in the area of, uh, of texture analysis, a uh, height of snow. Uh, so we're seeing more and more interest in uh, some of our end users looking at uh, doing snow measurements and things of that nature with LIDAR as well. So the workflow basically um, is starts out with the acquisition. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the system that was flown. Uh, this was a DJI Matrice 600 uh, being flown with the VX20 and uh, a dual uh, 
stereo looking uh, pair of, of Sony Alpha 6000 cameras. The whole concept between uh, 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 the whole concept of our of our product line is is to try to make lidar acquisition as reasonably accessible to the average person out in the field. You know, lidar is a complex technology. Lidar processing can be a lidar a complex process. It doesn't have to always necessarily be that complex. And so our concept of just press the yellow button uh, is our attempt to take the technology into the field, be useful and 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 um, uh, successful, but without having to have the you know the the proverbial lidar engineer uh, traveling along with the uh, the flight crew um, in order to collect good data. And of course, just a nice aerial shot of the system being flown, and I believe they're getting about 20 minutes on the uh, the larger. I forget the model number, but the DJI's got a larger model number on the battery, and they're getting about 20 minutes with uh, a very safe margin uh, left per flight. So LiDAR workflow, and I think this is the last of my, my stuff here, is really just about uh, the initial Juniper. By the way, Juniper Unmanned uh, is one of our partners. They're the folks that provided us the data being used for today. Just wanted to give them a, a very appreciative uh, shout out and uh, thanks for for sharing this data, and uh, and then from there, of course, we take the data, the base station, uh, PPK, the raw trajectory data, into a Planix's Pause Pack software where we do a, a trajectory correction. Added to that, the raw data from the scanner and the uh, the IMU data. This is the the pitch roll and yaw angles into our cloud station software uh, and 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 combine those products to get a calibrated LAS point cloud which at that point is available uh, for use in in you know one of many different workflows uh, in this case directly digestible uh, by the eCognition software and i believe that that is all i have i think you've got this information available to you but for those that would like to uh, reach out uh, with additional questions, I'm very happy to help out uh, later on offline. I'm going to transfer this back over to you. And Great. Thank you, Cliff. Um, <clears throat> As you can see, I've already got some stuff loaded in decognition, but before we get uh, get too far, I just have a few more uh, slides to show here. Get out of my notes mode. Um, should be able to see uh, my, my, uh, my PowerPoint again. Uh, if there were some questions that came up on, on Yellowscan, uh, please uh, hold on. We'll, we'll get to some question and answer at the end, but uh, I think we're excited to get into this automated solution uh, with, the, with the UAV based LiDAR. Just to give a quick overview, what are what are we really doing here? Uh, step one, we're looking at automated point cloud classification. So we're we're getting, uh, if you will, sort of a naked point cloud. It comes in. There's no classifications. And uh, what we're going to do is is we're going to give it uh, some some classifications here. We're going to automatically classify ground, vegetation, uh, buildings, and, and power lines. It, buildings if they're there, um, and uh, and uh, and the other things uh, as well. And then it's it's important to look at what type of how how are we assessing this risk and there are some industry standards so of course we have this power line we have a little diagram here of all these different um, these zones and uh, things we need to consider so first of all we have this proactive fault clearance here in the diagram what this is and and this is also going to be a pr parameter that you'll see uh, very shortly in eCognition that, uh, that we use these are uh, user defined parameters that they can use in the form and, and our rule set uh, we're going to be we have these as stored as variables um, so there are four important uh, uh, user parameters the next one is is branch removal zone and then we also have it that is sorry that's described in in our rule set as this min below distance uh, we then have what we call the feeder or the underlying vegetation. This is going to be influenced by the feeder corridor width uh, um, parameter within within eCognition. And then uh, we also have uh, vegetation, neighboring forest, uh, 
there's obviously going to be trees that might be outside of the the actual physical right of way or the corridor um, that are still high enough to pose a threat uh, in falling on or touching uh, the, the power line. And so we we're, these are also uh, things we want to identify automatically. And uh, we have obviously uh, formulas that we can use to calculate these distances uh, and, and the crossing, the crossing offset uh, being the last parameter that uh, that we use within our rule set. And so this is the background. Keep this slide sort of in the in the back of your head when we get into e-cognition because you'll see uh, these parameters uh, as seeing variables that are then used. I uh, remind myself to point them out to you when we talk about them, but these are what we're going to use then is essentially uh, to form our class descriptions. Then uh, we look at a, this automated risk classification. So we're taking these parameters, like I said, and then we apply them uh, in, within a classification, a class description, and we actually uh, classify the, the point cloud and create uh, some 3D vectors uh, from that as well. Although those could then, those will then form the basis for our deliverables as you see here. So again, uh, classifying the point cloud, just looking at it from a slightly different angle here, we have the various uh, risk uh, classes, if you will, uh, along the, the corridor, within the corridor, and the deliverables that we want as output uh, as a, a classified point cloud, that's wonderful. Um, but oftentimes the, the classified point cloud itself is what do I do with it? Um, it's, it's not uh, the most usual um, deliverable that you might have. So we also can deliver uh, vector files uh, that correspond to the crowns and trees uh, that need to be uh, examined. And we can do this in 3D, of course. So. That being said, how does it all work? Let's jump right into eCognition now. I will get out of, of the PowerPoint and you should see my eCognition screen. I see there are a few question flags up. Michael, before I jump into uh, into the into the rule set and, and explaining how this works with, uh, with this uh, LiDAR data, do we have any questions uh, that uh, should be answered? Any burning concerns? Uh, we do have some on yellow scan, uh, but do you wanna take those now or wait till the end? I think uh, we can we can we can uh, gather those and and wait for the end uh, when we do a bit of a recap. Um, but uh, let's let's just jump right into the rule set okay. and and then we'll come back to uh, questions uh, with with yellow scan. So don't, we'll we'll try and get you at the end. So uh, Cliff mentioned uh, they flew not only uh, with uh, the lidar uh, well they flew the lidar device obviously, um, but they were also collecting RGB. So no, this isn't a, a wonderful aerial image, this is actually what the uh, RGB view of the point cloud looks like uh, within eCognition. So I can see here in my view settings dialog uh, off on my left hand side that I'm looking at a point cloud. We've just named this point cloud LiDAR uh, for lack of uh, creativity. Um, and we have various uh, modi that we can select when we display uh, this point cloud. So I'm, I'm currently in the RGB mode. I can also look at this, uh, say, in its default uh, mode, and that's uh, looking at it based on height. We have this corridor here. If you cannot see it, I'll turn on some vector lines. These are the, the thick red lines here, and so the digitized uh, power line just running running down the, the center of uh, this, these power lines that we see here. I'm trying to uh, zoom in and, and show some of the detail uh, that we get from this and, and the environment that we're dealing with. So we're rendering uh, this point cloud here. I'll turn off those uh, vector lines and we can see uh, that we do have some lines here. We can also adjust our point size here as well. I get a better sense of, of what's going on. So what I've done uh, initially in this rule set, it's broken up into uh, three uh, parts. We could say the first part is what we call sort of a pre-processing. I've run this in advance because as you can see, um, this is a little slower. This is where there's a lot of uh, uh, data computation going on and it took, it took around uh, uh, 30 minutes uh, to run here uh, this morning. 
So I've run this ahead of time. We don't have to sit uh, here in, in the session uh, and let this uh, let this turn. But uh, what what exactly was I doing here? Well, first of all, I was looking at uh, calculating a right of way, and the way we've created this uh, really production oriented rule set is with some uh, very nice savvy uh, options. Uh, first of all, you may see anybody familiar with e-cognition um, might see that we have these. Uh, just these simple callouts here, these parent processes called then, else. Um, what's going on here? Well, what we've done is we've set up uh, some typical if then else clauses into our rule set uh, to adjust for the fact that not every uh, situation is going to have that, that magical data combination. We may not have uh, a, a vector center line for the corridor or overlaying our power line. So what do we do then? Well, there are several options in terms of identifying uh, power line cognition. We can use uh, various classification methods. We can use deep learning, uh, something we've done in the past as well. Uh, in this case, what we're running is saying if there's no existing uh, shapefile here, then we're running an automated point cloud classification algorithm within eCognition, and we'll calculate, we can classify um, the power line points themselves and identify them as power line, we can then use that information as the, the input to calculate this uh, corridor or ROI region of interest on. But uh, what I'm saying here with these if then else clauses is if I do have an existing vector layer, then I don't have to calculate um, all, the, all this uh, it automated point cloud classification uh, to determine where my power line is. I know where it is, so I can just simply set that up. I'm using a variable here with a binary input, one being if there's a vector a file available, and if that is true, we will then run in through this block of commands. So yes, this was true. I'm then running a vector buffer algorithm within eCognition. I'm creating uh, this buffer around my corridor based on my, my, my user-defined input on what the, the feeder corridor width uh, should be. I believe in this uh, particular scenario, I ran with something like 100 meters or, or 100 feet. Um, I'm then going to do a vector dissolve. I'm then going to take these vector objects that I've created and I'm then uh, I'm going to run a vector-based segmentation. So I'm now converting these objects, uh, these vector objects, uh, to image objects within my within my project. And all this is simply to reduce the amount of data that I'm pushing through uh, my processing. So I'm going to say I'm only in, in points within this right of way. So that's uh, one of the first steps we took here, and uh, we generated our buffer and we created some temporary point clouds uh, within eCognition. The next step is that we're, we're going to trans this, uh, transfer this into a, an overview map. Within this, we then run uh, some analyses uh, really geared at creating temporary point clouds for the various individual classes. I can see those here. So I've created a, um, some temporary point clouds now. Uh, I'll turn off the the primary input, and we've created a point cloud that just isolates our, our vegetation points. This is based in part off of the automated classification, and then the combination of that with the, the right-of-way that we've got here. So I've done this, I've created uh, several independent temporary point clouds within eCognition, one with my points that are associated with vegetation, one for the points that are associated with the power line itself, and then a third that uh, is just the stripped away ground points, so those, those last returns that we're getting from, from LiDAR. And that's what these independent uh, point uh, cloud files look like here within, within the viewer. The next step uh, that, that I really run here is we're breaking this whole piece down into subsets. So I'm, I'm for efficient processing within this within this project, I'm going to create uh, some subsets. I define uh, cell sizes to run within within, this, within each subset, and then we do here, as you can see, we do some rasterization of the point clouds and perform these analyses on each subset. 
primary goal here uh, really to um, take some of the, those individual point clouds, uh, for example, we have a point cloud with the, with the ground points, we're rasterizing it, and we're going to fill, uh, do some gap filling there so we get a nice uh, clean uh, ground layer, so a nice clean DSM, uh, DTM type information uh, from this. What we also do is we're going to run some cleanup, and we're really going to filter out um, any points from, from these point clouds and reduce uh, the amount of this, really streamlining our data uh, to improve the handling. Again, this, this rule set is looking at, um, looking at a production workflow, so we want to have this be as fast as possible. And by doing that, we can we can take our data, we can massage it, we can strip away some of the some of the points that are just not needed in this particular environment. And that's what this pre-processing step is doing. Uh, we're taking this, we're, we're calculating um, the important information, and we're getting this ready then for the next step, which is the analysis. And I have not run this. This analysis, as you can see in my note, runs uh, quickly, and that's the whole goal. We, we've we're we're doing these pre-processing steps ahead of time so that the, the, the real analysis can run uh, quickly and we can adjust that as needed. So this will be the, the actual processing that we do here. Michael, before I, before I run any farther, um, are there questions that have come up? Um, yeah, just a quick question about, um, can Ecognition work with any LAS file? That's a, that's a great question. Yes, eCognition it can work with uh, point cloud data as long as it's in LAS or um, LAZ format. So if you make sure your, your data is coming in in that format, uh, it can be loaded into eCognition and you can use it as I'm here. Yes. Well, and a couple more questions, but it can probably wait till the end if you want to keep going. Sure. If, if you wanted to throw one more at me now, we can, we can do that. And... Um, yeah, this might be for Cliff. Um, question is, is it possible to detect water content in the atmosphere at different altitudes with this yellow scan? Um, uh, I know what they're asking, and, and no, I don't think that the frequency of this particular system is tuned properly for atmospheric uh, monitoring. Uh, there's obviously some systems out there, both from a wind perspective and an atmospheric moisture, but this one wouldn't be uh, an appropriate one. Okay, and then kind of a follow-up to that one, um, there was a slide that mentions a LIDAR working in all weather. Um, so just kind of to confirm, is it safe to work on rainy days and in the cold weather, especially in Canada, <laughs> from the question? Yeah, so ra rainy days are a challenge right now just simply because we haven't properly uh, gone through all of the, uh, you know, the the, the moisture resistance uh, procedures that you'd want to do. A lot of the, uh, to be honest, a lot of the UAV platforms that we're flying on are as or maybe even at times more sensitive to certain types of weather events in the moisture side of things. I'll tell you, as far as cold con is concerned, though, we've flown uh, these systems at uh, in Colorado actually uh, at 11,000 feet uh, above sea level and as low as uh, minus five Fahrenheit. So um, we've done a fairly good amount of testing on cold weather and we haven't had any problems with that. That's good. And uh, Keith, there's a question about is this viewer, which I'm guessing they're talking about eCognition, uh, does it come with the LiDAR equipment? I guess it, maybe the question is, is there a package with eCognition and yellow scan? Uh, no, the, so, so the, e the Trimble eCognition software is, uh, is, it's, uh, is, a, is a separate package. It's, it's not being uh, sold in combination uh, with, with yellow scan products, at least uh, not at the moment. Um, but um, so if, if, if you're coming as a, as a yellow scan customer or anybody else flying a UAV LiDAR or LiDAR in general, or maybe using any type of uh, imagery data, um, eCognition uh, can, can, it can be purchased and, and used to do the, do the processing of, of this. It's not coming with a, a specific hardware uh, unit um, currently. So if there's uh, no more, we'll, we'll jump back in now to actually running this uh, find a risky vegetation uh, detection. So we, we've done the, the pre-processing, we've 
calculated um, the six we've, as you can see here, if anybody's familiar, we've actually generated image objects now. Um, remember there, we were using limits of this corridor. So we can see that the image objects are also restricted to being within this corridor. Uh, one of the other benefits though of reducing the data, like I mentioned before, so I said we, we created uh, independent uh, point clouds with any cognition. So just deriving, uh, taking those points out of the initial uh, point cloud called LIDAR and created these temporary point clouds, which I've noted here with temp PC veg as temp point cloud vegetation. And for this, uh, we've, we've run a segmentation and we've created a, a created image object. So if I turn them on here in blue, we can zoom in and we can take a look at these image objects, um, get a feel for what they look like at this point there. Uh, if we look at the LIDAR in the background, it looks a little scat, much um, uh, correlation, but this is uh, based on some of the rasterized products uh, from, from the LIDAR that we did in, in the background. So remember, image objects have to be created, like the name says, based on an image on a, on a raster file. So that's what we've done here. Uh, it's a, a chessboard segmentation. Uh, it's uh, going on very quick in the background, and we have these image objects for various um, for various uh, vegetation objects here. And now what we want to do is classify these image objects. And I mentioned before in that diagram, we are looking at class a class description that corresponds to those various parameters that were are, have been defined by, uh, by industry. And you can see now in my image object information that I have these uh, parameters set here. So we see this, this crossing offset, this corridor feeder width, we see this min below distance, and we see this proactive fault clearance. So those again tie into the, uh, to that, the description, those mathematical formulas uh, that we use to, to calculate those. And these, these parameters we will use then as variables um, for our class description. Uh, why do we want to use variables here? You see there, these are scene variables. Well, it gives us a lot of flexibility, uh, especially in a production-oriented uh, rule set. First of all, the user at the, at the very beginning, at the out, outset of a rule set can go in and as we can see here, we have this default user parameters for development and users can set various uh, various variables here. So you can see here's my maximum distance to vegetation to power line distance. This is what I was using to define my corridor. I set this to 100 meters. Um, and what this does is I can plug in to all different types of algorithms uh, within eCognition rather than a fixed value. So I'll open up this assigned class algorithm here. And you can see um, if anybody's familiar with, with the assigned class, um, you will say, well, gee, in the condition, there's, there's no value um, being listed here. What's, what's going on here? How is he classifying this neighboring forest um, class? Um, so I can open up the, the condition here. And again, it seems a little cryptic uh, be, be given the, the abbreviations we're using for the variables. Um, but what we see is we're using variables here and mathematical formulas within the variables. So we can, we can use that for our, our class description. And we'll run this, uh, this, this piece here, should go through pretty quickly. And now we will assign classes to the, to the, um, to the point, or not to the point cloud yet, but to the, to the image objects and let this run. The final step while this is running, preparing the deliverables. And this is simply taking the, the classifications here. So these four risk classes, and we're gonna take those classifications and then we're going to uh, associate those with the point cloud. So we will take the, the classification, we'll, we'll classify the point cloud itself based on these four risk classes. And then uh, the, the final step is in taking the vectors and we're we'll, generating uh, vector data sets that can then be loaded into GIS that contain all various types of parameters that we, we might want to use. So various attributes and feature information coming out of eCognition uh, that could be useful down the road in, in any type of GIS analysis that's going on. So as this runs, uh, Michael, any, any questions um, come in in the meantime? 
Yeah, we do have one on were the power line vectors provided from an external import or derived from the point cloud analysis? Right, so that's what those two, uh, was what I mentioned earlier was with this if then clause, if then else clauses. Um, so there are two options. Uh, the user has the, uh, has the option to bring in an external uh, shape file as a, so for the vector uh, line, or they can use the automated, automatic point cloud classification results in eCognition to identify the power line points and derive their buffer from those results. So this rule set is, uh, say savvy enough in, in this production grade to address both cases. If the uh, shape, the, the third party shape file, let's say, is there, then it will use the shape file. If it's not there, uh, we can, uh, it's smart enough to uh, recognize this and use the results of the automatic point cloud classification. So I've classified my image objects now. You see I have image objects classified as, as power line here, as well as these various uh, classes. We can see the uh, corresponding uh, class hierarchy type of legend here on the right. So I've identified here just vegetation that's outside the corridor. I've identified tree crowns that are outside the corridor, but high enough to pose a risk. We see in the blue here, the underlying vegetation and in the yellow, so this proactive fault clearance and then some, some uh, light blue. Uh, point uh, classes uh, for this a uh, branch removal uh, type class. That's wonderful. It uh, it looks uh, all nice here in in this view. Uh, but now we want to get into our actual deliverables. So we'll come down and one more thing we're going to do is uh, classify the point cloud. We'll run this and we'll, we'll take a look at these deliverables in just a moment. And then we're just going to remove some of some outlier points uh, from from the classification. And finally, we run this uh, 3D vector uh, generation. So taking the results of these, uh, these image objects, converting them into the vector files, uh, shape files that we can then output uh, for use outside of eCognition. And as this runs, we can take another question, Michael. Yeah, another question about um, the analysis you're doing with any cognition, is that just using the standard tools or is there a specific like, vegetation analysis tool that you're that you're using? Yeah, so um, I like to think of eCognition developer as a, as a large toolbox for not only image analysis, obviously here in this case, pure point cloud analysis. Um, what we're doing here, is we're using standard tools available within developer. All the tools that I'm using in my, my rule set, obviously I've, I've assembled them um, to create this rule set, but these are available to uh, every uh, eCognition. And uh, there's nothing you know, third party brought in here. There's nothing, nothing uh, extremely uh, secretive and, and, and fancy that's uh, uh, sort of RIP. This, is, uh, this rule set is, is using my skills as a developer. Uh, to to assemble the rule set. So I'll just run these last pieces here. We've classified our point cloud and remove the just the, the last little sections uh, here and can and create our vector files. Um, and then we and then we can take a look at this in in the uh, in the 3D viewer to get a sense of what's really gone on here. So just let this uh, run for a few moments, and we can we can also take more questions, Michael. Just as as these yeah. these he, algorithms go. Is chessboard the only segmentation that was used for the objects in this rule set? I believe we use a combination of chessboard segmentations. There we had the the vector based segmentation earlier in the rule set, and we were also looking at uh, multi threshold segmentation. So three different segmentation algorithms uh, were used uh, during uh, during this rule set. And uh, some of you out there might be scratching your heads. Wow, gee, why didn't you use the the glorious multi resolution uh, segmentation algorithm? 
Um, that's the one that uh, all eCognition users are, are familiar with and I guess we become famous for. Well, um, it's because it doesn't always fit uh, within each, uh, each analysis and there are lots of other algorithms that we can use uh, and lots of other algorithms that are, are faster uh, than a multi-resolution segmentation algorithm. So these approaches um, have given great results and have the have also a flexibility in, in the speed that uh, that was nice for particular analysis because again we're thinking production we're thinking going beyond just small snippets of data taking this for entire sections uh, of, of transmission line here and as this last piece runs we will then I'll turn on the vector layers and we can see what uh, this looks like And this will hopefully be done in just a few moments. Apologize that we've we've we taken up our hour here, but if you have some time, just stick with us a little bit longer. We we have some some other nice surprises up our sleeve here in, in the next uh, next 15 minutes or so uh, that uh, would love to to show. If you have to leave early, I apologize that we've run over. Um, but note. The webinar is going to be, it's always recorded and it'll be available and you can come in and catch up on, on what you missed in, in the recording. So I've run this now. We have our uh, vector results and we'll take a look at these now in the 3D viewer and get a sense of what, uh, what uh, are the deliverables that we've actually created here with any cognition. So, turn off our classification view first of all. Zoom out a little bit, and we can turn off this uh, full point cloud. I'm just going to take a look at the one called temp PC vegetation. Just represents my points in uh, vegetation. Uh, you see, I'm still in height. I can now turn on a classification view. So I've classified the, these points now, and now I can visualize this classification. Could be nice just to uh, match the uh, classification colors here. We can do that quite easily with uh, what's what we have in our in our uh, class hierarchy. And then everything matches nicely in terms of visualization. So 17 was this right here. And finally, so here we go. Now, now our, our color scheme should match up and I can come down with the uh, 3D subset selection tool and actually get a sense of what this uh, result looks like. I'm just creating a 3D subset here um, within eCognition, so I can I can examine my results in um, 3D, 2.5D, as you want to define them. Keith, you have uh, some of the trees that are green, and then some of them have that kind of purple in the center. Uh, what's the difference between that color scheme? So uh, we have this. Uh, so a tree, say up here where my where my mouse is located. So these are trees that are located outside uh, the corridor, but are still at at a height where they could pose a risk if, in in falling and touching um, the transmission line. That's what this uh, sort of this cyan purpley uh, color is. So we can look at this here. You might be wondering, well, where is the these these trees over here aren't too close. What we actually have here, though is, and I'm going to turn on the, the point cloud for uh, power lines and add this to our view. Uh, there are several transmissions in the, um, and when you actually look at this data set, there's a road that runs down the center of, uh, of this area and there's a smaller uh, line on one side of the road and then the larger, uh, higher line. Uh, excuse my lack of uh, professional terminology and I'm not from the power industry. Um, but here we can see uh, the results. We've classified these. Our points are available in uh, 3D. 
finally, uh, I said we, we created vector files. I can see that these vector files are available over on the left-hand side here in my view settings dialog. I can come in and turn these on and we'll take a look at uh, them here in the viewer. So we have then the vectors uh, colored in uh, according to the, uh, also, sorry, to adjust the class here. So um, this was our class colors and then these vectors will match the color scheme that we have here. Maybe become a little difficult to, to see within within the point cloud. So we'll zoom in. Take a look at this. And just to show we do have actual 3D vectors, we can turn off that point cloud and then see our results here. So these vectors are reflect the elevation of the objects um, that they contain. Finally, what type of information do we have here? So we can open up our thematic attribute table. And I will just pin off these other windows. And we can examine. Oops. the information here. So we have all sorts of attributes or in the e-cognition features that we can store in this file. We have all of the various distance attributes, the elevation max, min for each objects. We have various quantile elevations that we've decided to store. We have the number of points. And another one that I've chosen to, to calculate here is the cut volume for an object. So if I select an object here in, in the viewer, I'm actually going to jump down and I can see uh, this object in the thematic attribute table here, and I can get a sense of this, uh, of the actual volume that uh, we've just mathematically calculated here. I believe this is in the cubic feet, if uh, uh, feet, if I'm uh, if I'm correct in my in my calculation. So the volume in in feet for a particular object here, and I can jump through this table, clicking on the various objects, and jump to that to to get a sense of what's going on. So that is um, the, this corridor feeder analysis. It's run completely automatically. There's no manual touches other than me actually physically clicking in the rule set uh, A to adjust, uh, maybe adjust the initial parameters uh, for the for the um, for the variables, or uh, clicking execute. Um, if we had had eCognition server, we could have just sent this all off uh, to a nice server environment um, without really interacting within the eCognition project. Before uh, I move on to uh, the, the final part of, of what we wanted to present today, Michael, uh, in terms of what we can extract from uh, LiDAR data, in this case, this, this, this UAV-based LiDAR data, are there any questions uh, to, to what's gone on uh, right now? Uh, just a more quick one, um, because I think you broke up when you were talking about how these tools and e-cognition are, are available. Is, are they only available in developer uh, in that? Yeah, so um, the, this, this rule set was created in e-cognition developer. Uh, developer is our rule set creation uh, platform, if you will. Um, so if you want to work with uh, point clouds, uh, you'll have to have e-cognition developer. Um, and if you want to work with any uh, any type of an analysis like this on the point cloud, it's uh, the tools are available within eCognition Developer. And are these specific uh, rule sets that that you created are those available to download or to purchase somehow? Or? Uh, this particular rule set is, isn't available uh, online in say the eCognition community. It's it's one that uh, we've been developing. Uh, in-house, but uh, like I said, all the tools that are used here, there's there's no secrets, there's no nothing customized uh, from from our team. These are all using standardized tools uh, within uh, eCognition Developer, and um, 
we can certainly, if people are interested in the the the, the rule set itself or, or how this this could be used on their data, uh, they could, should certainly reach out to us, and we would be happy to be uh, exchange uh, knowledge in in some form or another. So the, the, the final thing I wanted to show today, I said we were going to try and push the envelope with LiDAR data. Um, maybe some of you are thinking, wow, gee, what, what, what could you do more than more than that? I mean, classifying the point cloud, extracting 3D uh, vector files for the objects. Well, this is uh, uh, some pilot work, project work we've been doing internally, um, looking at uh, point cloud data, what's what's possible within uh, within point cloud data. So again, I've got uh, a yellow scan data set, I believe, Cliff, this is the one that uh, was flown in, in Colorado or, or Utah. Um, we see uh, a, a transmission line here or a distribution line. And what I want to do from this line is I, at, this, at this point, I want to extract 3D vectors uh, from of the line itself. So if I come down here and just draw a small view box, a uh, 3D view box around this, this uh, section, we can see uh, what my goal is for this analysis. So when I look at this in 3D now, I see these four uh, independent lines. And what I would like to have is a vector line uh, that corresponds to each one of these uh, these lines as they are here. So that's what we're going to do here. This is what we call, uh, I'll say you might want to call it a point and classify or a semi-automated um, user interaction based rule set. Also a, a nice thing that can be created within eCognition. While this is closing, I should mention again, this is all uh, specific tools for eCognition developer. So the first thing I want to do, I'm just going to set some parameters. And I am then going to uh, set what is called a select a baseline. And I'm going to define just the what direction do I want. Uh, I'm going to be doing line extraction here. So I'm going to just give eCognition a general uh, vicinity of where uh, where this line is. I don't have to get too caught up in the specifics. So I'm creating a line uh, here just perpendicular to the transmission line, first of all. And then I'm going to drop a line, just a point up here. So I just have to drop three points. Ecognition then draws uh, three lines here. We can take a look at these. Uh, these are vector files within Ecognition. Um, you can see I'm not right on top of my, my transmission line here. Um, should still work. So I'm, here I'm just setting the general direction. Where are the points that I'm going to be looking at? What general vicinity am I in? The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set uh, some key points that are going to be used to create templates from, uh, from our point cloud. So I will come down, execute this, and then as a user, uh, this is where I have to physically interact and create, uh, just drop the three points who so will be entered into this 3D viewer. Uh, section here, and I'm getting a cross section of uh, of this transmission line. So that's where those those uh, select baselines. Um, that's where this comes into play. And I can see just some groups of points here. If you follow my cursor, these four little groupings of points. Those clusters are the points around each one of those uh, four independent lines. So I'll just drop a point roughly on each one of the clusters. And this is now where I'm going to establish uh, my template. So we're using a template a matching uh, technique here within this rule set. Let this uh, set to sort of finalize these, these key points as we've called them. And the final set, set now, I'm actually going to apply this template, just zoom out a bit. So we can see those vector files here, those little crosshairs, those are where my, my templates are located currently. And now using uh, the information I have stored in my baseline, I'm going to step down uh, this line with, uh, with my templates. And in this case, these, uh, these four 
uh, templates one, two, three, and four. And we're going to use these to create a 3D uh, vector uh, line. And what I'm going to do here, you see this five X or five times do, what this means is I'm gonna run, I'm just gonna simply run this uh, five times. And uh, as it's run, it's going to take this template, we're going to walk down uh, the transmission line, if you will, and we're going to apply this template to look at how the template fits with, uh, with, the, with the data. And as you can see, we've, we've dropped three points already here um, in the viewer. And here goes the fourth point. And you can watch this progress live in, in this particular uh, demonstration rule set here. And then we're going to connect these points with, with line information. And that's now a run. Turn off the points themselves. And we will now come in again using our 3D tool here. Just take this section of line where we let this run. And we'll take a look at these in or these lines now in 3D. So again, uh, nothing to see here. I haven't turned on the vector lines, so we can do that in the viewer. And now you can start to see this vector, these four vector lines appear here. I'll turn off the point cloud so we can see these better. And I can take these lines, I'm turning them within uh, the viewer. I'll turn this back on, reduce the, the point size here. We can see those uh, lines, uh, those vector lines. So this is uh, something we've been working on internally, uh, really just uh, extracting the line feature type uh, information um, from point clouds. Uh, one of the experiments that we wanted to see was whether uh, a, a UAV-based LIDAR sensor like Yellowscan uh, would support this rule set in running. This is something that if up until now we'd run on, on some of the, the, the Trimble Total Station devices that we had, so different different type of point density and and, uh, and, and collection method. So uh, it was really, really great to, to see uh, yellow scan data also cooperate in, in this type of environment uh, to create these types of results. So this was uh, for us uh, a nice success story seeing that uh, what, what we do for in one area can also transfer it to another uh, with e-cognition and, and really pushing uh, what we've done with our software. So that uh, brings my presentation uh, to an end here. I'm just gonna bring up the, the slide deck again. Um, and uh, at this point, if we have uh, some questions, we can, we can certainly field them. I think we can take another few minutes uh, to do this, uh, Michael, and uh, before we uh, close down for, for at least uh, my evening time here. Yeah, Cliff, we had uh, one for you on the yellow scan cloud station. Is that run exclusively online or is there kind of like a standalone version uh, that you can use? And, and the question is really around for large data set processing. Yeah, right now at this point in time, uh, CloudStation is a, a locally installed application. So we're not, uh, we're not to the point where we're moving into that cloud-based processing. Sounds good. And uh, I guess for Keith and Cliff, both. There's a lot of questions on, you know, if people are looking to get um, kind of this solution, the, the software and the hardware. What are the best ways to go about um, to kind of start that process of, you know, looking into if this is the right solution for a certain organization? Um, uh, Keith, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to jump in on that one real quick. Sure, go ahead. Um, although there's certainly no, um, I guess I'd say global uh, arrangement or partnership between uh, Trimble and Yellowscan at this point in time, um, 
individual local uh, dealers at the Trimble level um, are <clears throat> at, in various degrees uh, starting to show interest in the LiDAR products at, at Yellow Scan. Uh, we've signed up across the globe, you know, um, several, uh, probably on the order of 10 or 12 different dealers so far. So, you know, it might be the best that you just check with the local uh, dealer, see if they're already in the process of representing uh, the Yellow Scan product. If not, let them know you're interested. Um, have them call me or you call me and I'll uh, I'll talk to them and we'll we'll see if we can get something worked out. I, I think Cliff uh, fielded that one uh, exactly. So there's, there's again no official uh, partnership between Trimble and Yellow Scan. Um, but uh, I think the, the local dealers are the, the best uh, point of contact uh, in terms of both products. And uh, if, if you're on our eCognition website, you can certainly, that's www.ecognition.com, uh, you can certainly fill out the, the contact sales form there. And uh, then the sales representative will, will contact you regarding the eCognition software. Um, in addition, I know there's a question here at the end of this, uh, this webinar. Uh, if, you, if you have interest, uh, please fill that out and, and we'll, we'll definitely uh, reach out to you. And Cliff, um, a question on the the GNSS or GPS sensors used with the yellow scan system. Uh, yellow scan system. Are there certain types you can use, or are there multiple uh, you know, versions of the the GPS unit you can use with that? Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the, uh, the the base station receiver that you would use to uh, to collect your uh, your correction signal. Um, assuming that's the case, then uh, yeah, there's a, a variety. It, you just need to be able to provide a Rhinex file uh, to the Pause Pack solution, and uh, you know there's certainly Trimble products out there, but there's others if you're already invested in in other products. Sounds good. And Keith, a question for you. Um, uh, I guess the question is, would it be possible to deploy a portal-based tool uh, to create this type of data? I guess if you use developer, server, and architect, is there a way to kind of create some sort of portal that users could log in and and uh, kind of do this analysis? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely a possibility. Um, we actually have a, a, a dealer, our local dealer in Germany, Tama Group, who has uh, created a, a portal for forestry type applications. It's available now through, through their website um, where they have, um, I believe I, I wasn't involved in actually creating the product itself, but uh, there are some e-cognition engines, so server engines, uh, kind of working behind the scenes uh, to do analysis uh, to a certain extent. What uh, portals will look like will depend on your needs. You, you can combine; they can be combined with, uh, I'd say, probably server and architect type uh, applications would would be. Uh, be the best fit uh, for this, whether it's something that's going to do, be hosted in the cloud, um, and uh, it's something you're going to have to think about your data, pushing data back and forth, uh, what type of uh, requirements and restrictions are out there. That's good. Uh, and you guys both kind of covered, you know, how to maybe go about purchasing this, but there's a lot of questions that have come in about if someone isn't ready to bring this uh, in-house, uh, is there a way to, you know, leverage um, this as a service, both from the, um, you know, the the LiDAR side and from the e-cognition side? Is, are there people out there that provide these services um, for the solution? Well, I, you know, from from the from the uh, the data acquisition side, I would say that, um, you know, depending on which uh, which region, you know, globally you're you're talking about. Uh, there's there's a, certainly a growing uh, capability within the service markets. Uh, in the U.S. market, I'll say it's it's been quite matured at this point, and I would say there's definitely um, many different uh, folks you could reach out to, um, and what type of you know back office product uh, flow that they provide uh, is I guess the the you know what you'd have to look into. Sounds good. Um, and then Keith, maybe one last question for you. Mm -hmm. You could probably wrap up. Uh, and I'm not sure if you'd cover this, but um, in terms of automating this workflow, I guess if someone flies this data every month or every six months or every year, is this something 
once you set it up, you can just reload in that data and, you know, just kind of processes and updates, um, you know, your analysis. Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, the, the rule set is established. It, it's it's working. Uh, the, the development time was was put in to, to create it. So it works on, on universal. And I, I've uh, I've done so. You know, I've I've executed this did it, this rule set not yellow scan data, but other uh, lidar sources, not just UAV based lidar, but aerial uh, lidar data, and it also. Uh, functions quite well. So you can take this uh, this rule set and uh, when you fly new portions of line or you refly uh, your corridor, uh, whether it's on some type of regular basis, every time you come in, you can you can start submitting these jobs, run them through the rule set, and you'll get um, a new set of results uh, that you can that you can use uh, again and again. So this is it's fully automated. Uh, it's designed uh, to wonderfully to, to work within an eCognition server environment. Um, so you can you can really push through big chunks uh, of, of data, uh, full in, in batch processing mode, and just walk away for, let's say, the weekend and, and come back on Monday morning and, and start jumping right in, into the results. So it's, uh, it's not just for specific uh, data set that we looked at today or not just for a uh, yellow scan specific uh, lidar products it, it can it can handle um, the, the point clouds uh, is one thing you may want to consider if you're working with some very old uh, lidar data um, whether the, whether the point cloud density is is good in, in certain spots specifically for that uh, the automated classification of the power line itself some sometimes there it's uh in in some of the uh, say the older generation lidar, it's not as uh, it's not as well suited for that uh, detailed of a classification. But that's why we integrated in the uh, piece on option for using a vector uh, data file as well. And uh, if that uh, wraps up our questions, um, if if we didn't get to your questions, first of all, I apologize again. I apologize for running a bit over today, but uh, it was fun and we had a lot of cool stuff to show. Um, if uh, we didn't get to your question, don't worry. We, we always go through those uh, the question results. Uh, we have that uh, that information, and uh, we will reach out to you afterwards. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, for your time today. Again, uh, my name is Keith Peterson. I'm the product manager for Trimble Ecognition Software. And I think the best way to, to follow up with us is, again, if you're looking for sales-related information, you can use the contact sales form on our website. Or if you have questions uh, uh, that uh, didn't get answered or looking for more information, you can always reach out to support at ecognition.com. And uh, this is the best way to get a hold of uh, one of our uh, support engineers in, in the the, the timeliest of manners. And Cliff, uh, Holly's information is here as, as well. Cliff, uh, do you have any other uh, closing remarks that you'd like to put in? No, no I just appreciate everyone's time. I know that uh, everyone's busy uh, these days and uh, thank you for uh, taking such a big chunk out of your time to, uh, to be involved. This was a really great uh, presentation and I appreciate being uh, asked to be involved. Thank you. All right, uh, that being said, Thank you again, and we will sign off. I hope to see you next month in our next eCognition webinar. Uh, topic is to be determined at the moment, um, but I uh, hope you enjoyed this one, and uh, see you next time. Bye.